Thanks, guys. All right, so I'm going to talk about wicked problems and, and design, and, and I'm going to go a little bit beyond that and talk about complexity. Uh, and these are perspectives from, from myself and uh, you know, a bit of our team and how we work. I, I just want to give you some context for uh, the company that I've been driving forward for the last six years. Uh, this is top, uh, just a few samples of what we've been doing. And so we, we've been working in quite a variety of different spaces uh, over the last six years. And our mission from the beginning was under the motto of, of shaping the new. And, and generally, that meant not only new products and services, but new ways of working and uh, breaking down boundaries of what design really is. And, and so this is something that's never a finished goal, uh, but allows us to explore a lot of different processes to serve to actually address emerging goals uh, as, as we work, and hopefully being in the forefront of change uh, with, with how we're working. And and so one of the last things that's happened, a lot of you I, or a handful of you I, I recognize here tonight, and some of you may know me from some other talks or just through context. Uh, I was previously CEO at Top, and recently one of the changes is that I've taken on the group role uh, to manage a couple of companies. So one is under Top, and I'm working at the strategic level with strategic partnerships. But also another company that we started under Top was called Noodle, and, and this is a uh, platform for actually the, the development and design. Uh, so it's a software platform, and also helps us experiment uh, with, with different uh, technologies, different platforms, different UIs. Uh, this is something that I'm now focused on uh, quite a bit of my time, uh, but I am got a foot in both places right now. Uh, most of my stuff will be talking around uh, top here, but we do find that tools and what you, what kind of tools you use uh, as designers, as developers, as product owners, makes a big impact with which kind of challenges you can take on as well. So, what kind of industries, you know, where do we find our problems that we address? Well. Uh, you know, we've got these 30, there's probably 40 on this list now, uh, different domains. And the underlying technology, of course, is important in these spaces. Um, and, and you can see that, oh, there's a lot of different technologies that drive these places. But we do f find that there's actually a bit of a sea change across all of these things, across all of these industries in terms of how they're creating value. Uh, they're in the midst of different types of transformation. And, and, and that's what I really want to be getting into. Uh, and w what the important role that design has to play. Just for context, uh, how, many you, how many of you actually see yourselves as a designer? Okay, so we've got about half. Somebody who's involved in just, it, other than the designers, uh, digital products in general, otherwise. And who's left? Who didn't I? The, the, the press or the depressed. Uh, yeah, but that's that's great, uh, and you know I, I think this affects a lot of a lot of different organizations. But for all of you, I, I think this is going to be a slightly philosophical talk uh, and f philosophical uh, set of reflections. So hopefully the Q and A will actually uh, hope I hope will be able to take a personal side of this and be able to have a more of a conversational stance on this. This is the kind of announcement. I'm going to see if we can get some volume on this. This was announced about nine months ago. And if and if you weren't certain, this was the Google I/O AI making that call. Uh, and and th this kind of underlying technology. Uh, solving a very difficult problem, but actually a very simple, valuable problem is what gets me pretty excited when I see different announcements, and, and particularly when we get to participate in things like this. And this was somebody just essentially being your, I mean, it, it, we've all had this idea a million times, you have some sort of digital assistant, but now they're bringing it to the fidelity uh, that it needs to be. But we also have these types of things that we do where we're working on more strategic levels, uh, where we're also working on hard problems. This is the summary of 
uh, a, a vision of the future that we created for here. Here is a, a location company. They used to be Nokia Maps and Navtech way back. Um, but they recently were acquired by German automotive manufacturers a few years back. And they had to decide, what do they do now? And so we started looking at different versions of the future and finding strategic models for them to actually draw their strategies and product strategies from. So this is one of several visions that we created for here. And then, of course, a lot of the prototyping and, and design and d product design work came underneath this type of model. Th this is the type of areas that get us really excited, something with scale, something with impact, new challenges around behavioral uh, or large trend shifts that are emerging. And we can see this, of course, across a lot of companies, Facebook uh, every year. This is a, a, a chart from a couple years ago uh, that Facebook I think pretty much every year they put out some sort of 10-year roadmap. And this is super exciting stuff. Uh, this was where they were at the time, ecosystems, and I think they're getting into making products really shine and, and actually having all of these different properties and then getting into uh, hitting connectivity, AI, VR, AR, et cetera, and making these things relevant to the general public. Um, it, the thing is, though, as a designer, and I am a designer. I'm not only a designer, I'm a designer with an art school background. Uh, what I realize is that math is hard. These things coming up, those are really hard things to do. Uh, and we get into IoT, and physics is hard. I, I don't know anything about physics. Uh, and and we, we work with Airbus uh, and logistics simulations, different systems. They're, they're all really hard. Um, and so I show these things to students. Sometimes they give courses and lectures. And, and what I tell them is, oh my god, the future looks fun. These things are all amazing. Um, and then I tell them, but you're all fucked uh, as, as designers. And why, why would I tell them that? And the, the, the truth is, this is what I see. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not just students. It's, it's honestly all designers that we get. And it's the majority of designers that we see a lot of portfolios come in from. Uh, and I want to tell everyone, like, yeah, this looks awesome, but it all kind of looks similar. Uh, this is the hipster designer, um, and I spent a lot of time in San Francisco. I still see a lot of this work, uh, probably there more than anywhere else. And their portfolio looks like this, or this, uh, or this. And, and really, it's not bad work. Uh, there are a lot of good designers, and, and even great designers, but too few seem worried about their ability to um, influence what's coming, what is coming in the future. Uh, they're still thinking of their craft as pixels in, in terms of what they can influence. Um, and, and I kind of want to go through some of the stuff in terms of what, what's important to not be fucked in the future. So this is an S-curve. Uh, it, it's a pretty old uh, economics concept. Essentially, every major technology goes through an S-curve. And just generally, it's you know, market performance over time. And, and you see a, a, a huge acceleration uh, when, you, when you have uh, the adoption of a new technology and its propensity for, for innovation. And it's essentially describing a repeatable pattern that says, how does a new, the emergence of a new technology or a new platform uh, create value in a market. And, and, and we can see in rec recent decades with PCs, web, mobile, um, there's a guy named Benedict Evans. He's now at Andreas and uh, Horowitz uh, VC firm, and he talks about this, and he's an analyst. Speaks about it very eloquently, uh, better than I ever could. But essentially, it, it's the rise of value in these technologies 
that I would posit that in order to accelerate value over time before something becomes kind of standardized and peters out, um, that design practice is playing a more and more frequent role in this acceleration. And so I, I want to just look historically for a moment, and this is not something, don't, don't hold me to the exact mappings here, uh, but, but to be illustrative of, of different design practices over the last hundred or so years, uh, w where is design accelerating value, um, particularly ones that reach people? And this is design as innovator, uh, design as something that accelerates value over the course of time. And I think if you look at things like industrial design uh, and, and kind of a golden age of industrial design in the early 20th century and digital graphic design, and this is not to say that you know, graphic design is not present today or important, but when was the spike in value? And where did designers play a role in this industry? Um, you know, you can go back to mass production and see that industrial design, by being able to design things for mass production and combining with the technology with a design sensibility, enabled that through Bauhaus and things like that. Digital printing, desktop pub publishing, there's a confluence of tooling, technology, and, and a want to actually drive that from a design perspective to accelerate that. Personal computing, mobile, web, um, all different practices of interaction or UX design in some sense or another. And you have results like this, or this, or this, uh, and, and tools like this, I, I would actually go out on a limb and say that, to me, Flash as a tool is a representation of perhaps the most successful design tool to give influence over the internet today, still, in terms of the actual transformative effect of value uh, on what you perceive as web content, uh, web interaction. There was no other spike like that except for, for Flash. And so you go back to these things, and these types of roadmaps are not a bad place to look for what's coming next. Um, but what we can be certain of is that mobile itself, which has still, I, I mean, in Sweden, when I talk about this, people, a lot of people say, yeah, I'm kind of post-mobile and stuff. Everywhere else in the world, pretty much, is still trying to get into mobile. It's still a real thing to, to get into responsive, to just get a mobile app out there. Um, and certainly if you look not only at the consumer companies, but actually where all the digital transformation is taking place is in large industrial companies like a Schneider Electric, like, a, like an Airbus, and these are you know, multi-hundred thousand person companies around logistics. This is where a lot of transformation is happening. Mobile is still a big thing, but mobile is not really the innovation driver. So where, where are we today? Uh, what journey are we on as, as designers? So, in the same way that new markets and, and new technologies need to be created uh, in order to create new areas of growth, new design practices also diminish over time in terms of their ability to create value. These, of course, are related to each other. And so if we have mobile UX practices today, um, you know, mobile UX is actually, I mean, it's hard, but there's a lot of best practice out there. If you guys use something like Webflow or Squarespace or any of these templates, pretty good. It's, you know, and there's actually native app builders out there as well. It's not bad. It doesn't do everything, but it's pretty good and it gets you the best practice. It's not necessarily easy to do exactly right, but the amount of innovation in this space is getting more and more minimal. Um, so, so what's next? Um, where is the most value for developing our design practices? Um, you know, you're not really blowing any mi minds with this stuff. Looks good, looks solid, you'll get hired, you'll do well in your company, you'll execute on goals. Um, but I would go back to, to this wonderful quote. This is from the, the 50s. Um, George Nelson at the Chicago Institute of Design. Uh, it was described as precipitating a near riot during the Q&A session. And he said, the superb technical skills of designers were being used to convey the most mediocre of ideas. And, and I would say that generally, uh, a lot of the designers are asked to convey mediocre ideas right now. They're not invaluable, but they're not taking leaps. And so what are these new types of practices emerging today? What type of value is still to be discovered? And what type of practices? Well, these are still under experimentation. How are we addressing AI, mixed reality, urban systems? Uh, they won't be as straightforward as in the past. 
and I think I'll get some disagreement on this. Generally, I think a lot of design practices from the past 100 years or so, uh, particularly the last 70 years, have been fairly incremental. And of course, there are meaningful differences, but if you go from graphic design to user experience design or interaction design to mobile UX, there's a fairly linear plotting of, of what's going on there. Uh, it, it is not the, the massive sea change uh, you, you may expect. And I would say that this time is different. So why, why would I say this? Historically, it has been fairly incremental or design has been fairly accessible to designers. Uh, I, I think we're in the midst of a much larger change of complex forces. And, and there are a number of different complex forces which we can identify as being at work here. So I'll, I'll try to ad illustrate four of them, uh, or a handful of them here. Um, I think there's a fourth industrial revolution. This is a very broad force. It's actually contained a lot of different forces. But as an example, in China, uh, over the next 20 years, there are 300 new cities being built uh, of over a million people each. Uh, every week until 2050, we'll have a million people added to cities. And industry, under Industry 4.0, this very large umbrella, you have these massive shifts of urbanization, climate change, economic disparity, mobility, decentralization, cyber, physical systems. Um, and you can go back and historically, I mean, just for, for reference, to, to ref as a refresher, the first industrial revolution was all about steam power and mechanized production. Uh, second, use electric, uh, electric power to create mass production. And the third, which I would say we're shifting away from, is electronics and information technology to automate production, which we're kind of in the midst and probably evolving. Um, you know, I think the third one was starting from the mid last century, um, and there was a lot of fusion of different technologies and practices. But now we're really looking at something characterized by velocity, by scope, uh, by, by absolute impact. And the speed at which it's changing is much faster than previous things characterized indus as industrial revolutions. Um, and, and this is picking up at an exponential pace rather than a linear one. And where we become involved is that be it, it, it's impacting every industry. Every industry has to respond to these things. Uh, and, and so the next technology platforms may not be simply another S curve. Uh, another incremental shift or another add-on to the last S, um, but the actual scope of transformation is so large that entire systems of production and consumption, management, governance are shifting themselves. The other one, of course, is a new type of technology uh, that, that's emerging, and, and technology has typically emerged to solve very uh, to solve problems, um, and, and these have scaled over the last. Uh, hundred years or so as a byproduct of industrialization and automa automation. But there are, what's interesting is that there's a lot of technology that's been created but is only now being realized and it's being realized at speed and scope. So one of these of course is, is around uh, AI. Um, I visited a friend at Xerox Park a couple years ago. He runs the innovation unit there and he took me on a tour and, and I got to see all sorts of amazing things. I'll show you pictures after. But one of the things that was really insightful was that all of this essentially basic math around machine learning and AI was done 60 years ago. Uh, it, it's mostly completed. Uh, and it was all done on, trans, uh, on, on punch cards. And right now, these guys, smart guys still at Xerox Park and other Bell Labs and these old places that have all these punch cards, their superstar scientists are in the midst of transcribing punch cards to Python. That's the big thing because all of the cloud stuff is there to deploy it at scale and process them. The other one is new mediums, of course, which is like data, connectivity, cloud, and, and, and so on. Um, and again, it's the same thing as new technologies in a way. And then there's new business models like asymmetric competition. Um, asymmetric competition is things like Google. You know, These guys don't really care what your business model is. They can create value anywhere and monetize it through advertising or, or in some other way. Um, I show some dry cleaning here. There was a company in, in London a number of years ago, and, and the name escapes me, but what they were doing was they were offering cheaper dry cleaning than their competitors. They were in an upscale neighborhood, and they were maybe 20, 30% cheaper. 
So it's like kind of kind of a weird thing to do in an upscale neighborhood. The reason was was they were actually uh, solving an asymmetric problem, meaning as a non-linear problem of their business, and they were taking sizing of uh, of bespoke sorry not bespoke garments but high-end couture or designer high-end designer. Uh, garments are very difficult to say that this Italian Prada thing versus G German Hugo Boss, how does your size four match this one size four? And so when you do online shopping, how do you know the right size is the right size? Well, if you know the person dr dropping off the dry cleaning has a size four Hugo Boss, but a size six Prada, you can then provide that data outwards to a lot of e-shopping sites. And so they would drop their costs on their dry cleaning and create this service where they could then, of course, monetize on the data. And this is essentially what a Google, a Facebook, and Amazon largely do. Um, you know, you can let the imagination run a little bit. And with Amazon's recent acquisition of Whole Foods, sure, they could give away free coffee uh, and compete against Starbucks in Whole Foods if they also provide bathroom access and actually do urinalysis to see your health data based on when you pee because you drank so much coffee. I, I don't know. There's all sorts of stuff that you can get very creative with your service or your product ideas as soon as you start thinking in a different way. And so we have these things like asymmetric competition, industry 4.0, emerging technology being very complex. Um, and complexity, if we can harness it, uh, leads us to the ability to look at something um, called wicked problems. Now, this is probably actually framed up incorrectly. It doesn't necessarily create wicked problems. It allows us to look at them. Who's, who's actually been familiar with the idea of wicked problems in the past? Oh, that's more than ever when I've had this conversation. So the, the textbook definition is it's a problem that's difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, often changing requirements, difficult to recognize. Um, and the more time we spend in complexity, the more of a certain type of problem we're able to see. And I'm, I'm really not saying that these things lead to wicked problems. They're, they've always been there. And in fact, the term wicked problems was originally used to describe social problems like poverty or uh, education or, or, or addiction um, by a guy named Horst Rittel in the 60s. Um, in the 90s, early 90s, a guy named Richard Buchanan published the paper called Wicked Problems in Design Thinking. And if you haven't read it, uh, you can even t talk to me later and I'll get you the MIT PDF link. It is a fantastic uh, paper to read. Uh, and, and of particular interest were 10 characteristics of a wicked problem that, that Richard Buchanan identified. And I'll go through a handful here. So one is that there's always more than one possible explanation. And I'll, I'll take a kind of a, a banal example of that. So we could have always more than one possible explanation for something. Well, what if somebody gives you the, the design brief, design a socially valuable experience? Well, wh what, does that, what does that mean? Connect me with my friends and let me share my events? Does it mean turn my phone off when I'm on a date? Does it mean introduce me to a new person every, do every day? That's fairly simple. but. Really, when you extend on that, you'll see that there's a lot of different explanations. This does not come up to math or e an equation. There are equally valuable ways to pursue problems that actually have just different characteristics and qualities to them. Another is that there's no definitive test. These things go kind of hand in hand. Uh, we worked with Skadeverket last year. Um, and you can imagine getting this brief. Design a service that gives people a better sense of engagement and understanding of the tax system. Cool. It, I mean, it's a great design brief. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that testing that is, is actually very difficult um, because of the amount of complexity baked into there and what taxes mean to people. Now, I think this is one of the most critical characteristics to pay attention to uh, because it's not something most of us are actually familiar with. Solving the problem is a one-shot operation. Many of us have been hammered in with the idea of um, uh, high-paced high iteration and lots of testing and lean startup. Um, but I want you to think about architecture. 
you create a building. You don't get that chance a second time around. You create the building once. If you got to rebuild it, it's you know people are very un unhappy with you. Uh, the, the other year we went down to Lesbos. A couple of people. Um, we were working with an NGO, and this is a photo uh, from a couple of our designers, and they were. This is the life jacket graveyard down in Lesbo, uh, predominantly from Syrian refugees uh, and migrants. And we performed design research uh, on, on this. Uh, it was about a year ago. Um, and at first glance, many of the issues facing migrants uh, resemble problems anyone else may have in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, communication, information, presentation, medical help, navigation, payment. Uh, and in fact, they are some of the most uh, Syrian refugees in particular are, are some of the most technically savvy people you'll find. Uh, it was a very mobile first culture and lots of great engineering schools uh, from the region. The, the problem is that if you implement a solution that, for instance, may give leak an IP address uh, or give some sort of metadata either through uh, directly as a leak from your, your information system or simply through usage or tracking or accounts. Uh, the Assad regime was looking at digital data and account usage for communication to families back home and then carpet bombing those areas where the IP address originated from. So this is not a solution where you can use Lean Startup. And there are many of these, whether it be environmental or social, uh, political, where it is a one shot. And, and, and there are techniques for, for addressing this, but it is not Lean Startup. And if we go further on, every problem is unique. And again, I, I strongly encourage you to, to look at this uh, paper. So w one of the things is it's really important to know what kind of problem are you solving? Because not all of problems are, are wicked either. Um, but there will be more and more problems that are wicked problems accessible on this other side of the curve once our design practices uh, mature. Um, but in the, they're going to be in reach. And so we have this to look forward to, which I think is emerging today, that we are going to be, as designers and people working within the digital space, are going to be more and more active in addressing these larger order or simply more difficult problems. Um, from a pure business standpoint, if you're participating in a business, uh, what we're starting to see is that they're always a defensible business. You're always using something of value when you do something hard. Uh, and if you're the one to solve something that is, is, or at least address something that is wicked in a valuable way, you are creating value. There are ways then for your business, for the company you're with, to, to make that a, a, a good thing. Of course, you can still work in NGOs. You can do it for yourself as well. Uh, and other governmental organizations or social organizations, uh, which is where we will see more and more designers participating. Uh, but in any sense, by the nature of a wicked problem, you are creating something unique. It has to be. Not only unique, most likely, in the implementation, but it's most likely an evolving service. It's most likely a service that is personalized and tailored to the users or the groups. So almost every instance of consuming those solutions to addressing wicked problems will be unique as well. Um, one of the nastier characteristics of a wicked problem is that by solving it, you create more problems. There's a good and a bad thing. Uh, the good thing is you always have work. The bad thing is, well, you're never finished. Um, but ultimately, you're going to be able to create and identify spaces that you can own and being in the one who's in control of solving those problems. So five years ago when we started, six years ago now, when we started Top, we were in a very different climate. Those are the mobile UX glory days. And team members had been designing for Android, for Google, and BlackBerry 10, and a version of Ubuntu, big OSs. When we started Top, um, we did a Tizen OS, which is a, a mobile and IoT platform for Samsung. Um, but the industry was kind of peaking from a, a consultancy who wanted to shape the new. And so we've shifted ourselves over. Uh, really, this is where we're, we're interested in. Um, and this means not sh only shaping the experiences, as I mentioned, but the tools uh, themselves. And I'm going to go through a little bit. 
I think of some of the tools. So just quickly, like, wh what does design do in this space? Um, what happens to all the designers? What does design do? Well, you know, of course, we, I think we all know that design is more than craft. It's also an approach. Uh, it's something that can be reapplied. You are designers or been accessible to design or practice design thinking. You can take that and abstract it and apply it elsewhere. Uh, there are technical skills to build up, though. Um, so let's try to make it more concrete. So by helping to identify what a designer is, we can also identify what an engineer might be. Uh, the engineer creates things. The designer doesn't create things. Uh, the d engineer implements solutions. Uh, the engineer will always have a job. The designer, pretentious starter pack over here, um, design is often seen as something that's visualizing a plan, identifying a plan for something, and it engineering breaks down tasks and ele executes elegant so solutions to those. Uh, it's quite a tag team. Another definition is design is human intention made visible. So this is around the planning part of things. And so it's a plan, a specification, a visualization. Uh, and you can look at how this might be addressed from before to now in terms of that kind of planning and the types of changes that we're seeing. So you know, this is simply design a gallery app that displays all of my photos in chronic chronological order, super simple. But now today, the briefs are really pretty close to this. Design a gallery app that lets me express myself to the world and automatically shows my favorite image and knows how to share pictures with my friends without me having to do anything. But make sure it doesn't share anything private and I should be able to do it with my voice, touch, or control it with my mind. That's not so far off from an actual brief. Um, you know, Traditional UX mediums that the designers are using uh, are usually around pixels. Uh, paradigms around uh, windows and icons, uh, form, touch, uh, interaction, motion, iconography. Uh, and we're getting into being able to, or we should be able to, design for systems and data and intelligence, organizations and services. These are mediums, and I think it's important to look at these as mediums, not just context, uh, that you are implementing and leveraging uh, and ser searching for new ways to work with these mediums. And so we want to move not only from human intentional made visible, but also tangible as well. And, and, and so, um, you know, the, these are, you know, it's just kind of a reminder that tools themselves, in terms of making things tangible, uh, they matter. And they do, you choose a tool for the mediums you have. Exploration matters. You know, this is, does anybody know what this one is? No, uh, this is. Oh, there we go. So this is PostScript, uh, and then we got PageMaker 1.0, um, and it m became incredibly accessible. Same underlying technology, different tooling allowed us to shape things. Uh, this is 3D Studio Max 1.0. Here's Flash, which I still maintain is the most influential design tool ever to come out. This is Unreal, Unity, custom design engines for 3D. Uh, it's more than you know, more than a plan. It's a way to manipulate. Uh, it's a simulation of the output. We, of course, create our own tooling here. I'm going to skip through the pitch part. Uh, but I will show you one quick thing. We want to be able to sketch with these tools. We want to be able to manipulate new mediums very quickly. So essentially be able to capture things very quickly, transform things into data. Oh, yeah. OK, man, mail. Um, and work with these things. But of course, these toolings, we're going to be able to work with data. We're going to be able to work with farm systems, logistics. And essentially, like we really want to be able to find the tools, regardless of what they are, and create the tools that address these types of mediums. Um, and find also the process and the methodologies for doing that as well. One of the things that we're working very hard on, and I can't really, uh, I can't really show off too much uh, right now, uh, but I, I wanted to spark some imagination with you, is the idea of simulation. So simulation is, the idea, uh, is an idea that's been around for a long time, uh, particularly it's very familiar with the uh, aerospace or you know, doing flight simulators or car simulators uh, or you know, even weather simulations. This idea of taking enough data points uh, in interaction models and algorithms to actually simulate what this context experience might be and be able to feed different conditions through that. What I would say is that 
working in simulations is absolutely going to be something that designers need to participate in if we're going to solve these higher order problems. So the idea of going down and working with migration or working with privacy on Facebook or something really difficult, we are going to need to simulate many, many different types of scenarios at a scale far higher than A-B testing will ever bring us and with a much wider scope of different conditions fed into those simulations. Um, and, and we're working in a number of different contexts where we're simulating a lot of data sources and feeding them into what might look like a simple mobile app. But this sh shift is actually taking a mobile app and feeding in enough different simulated contexts that you can never do on your own by doing basic user research or live A-B testing, uh, but in fact creating systems that will then find a way to create those conditions for us. Uh, visualization in real time, this is a type of simulation of a complex condition, uh, but, but very, very simple. I'll actually show you. This. Where we're, of course, in this case, this is a more traditional car type simulator where we're working on the UI in real time but actually feeding this through a, uh, in this case, it's Unreal Engine, and taking all the physics data, the positioning data, simulating things like weather and other conditions that may affect our experiences. But this is a fairly banal type of problem. It's still the tip of the iceberg for working, essentially combining this idea of context and simulation with the development of, a, of an experience. But we're also going to be rethinking assumptions about, you know, the basics even today. You know, is it the end of the rectangle for us as we work in AR and VR? Uh, what is visual design? Is it going to be algorithmic in nature rather than just static uh, uh, color layouts? Is How personalized and tailored is it going to be? Where are we going in terms of the emotional consistency? How do we know people? and How do we tailor things? Uh, what problems are we solving for people? And I think these are only <laughs> hardly even hints at, at new practices. Um, uh, we're trying to anticipate the needs of these emerging problems and practices, and, and, and so that's, that work's not done. Just as the fourth industrial revolution is just beginning, uh, our ability to address these things is in a constant state of experimentation and exploration. So there is no defined what is your, my practice today. I'm going to leave you with four um, perspectives uh, about the shared responsibility of designers uh, and anyone else they're working with. So, wicked problems have always existed, uh, but now design should either be asking to solve them themselves or is actually being asked to solve them and participate in them. And I think as a designer or somebody who works with designer, it's important to not only ask them for the, the mediocre problems, but to really ask designers or develop design practices yourself to work in these wicked spaces and solve these different order of problems. The design process of working with uh, AI will look dramatically different to design processes today and, and, and uh, machine learning in general. Um, and and I, I think we need to challenge the expectations of, of design results and whether that's you recruiting, whether it's building your own portfolio and experiences, uh, whatever it might be, I think we have to challenge what the result of design looks like. And, you know, of course, the most impactful projects are the ones that are not prescribed. Uh, there is no fixed best practice. We need to truly integrate designs where all skill sets are present, uh, not just the one, you know, recording a plan or requirements as the designer. Um, and design will necessarily need to be something that everybody needs to participate in as a process. Um, and one change is that working in these types of problems and in this emerging areas of, of complexity is that you will be more often setting something in motion than making a release. You will be setting something that is evolving, setting something that you're testing or experimenting with into the wild. Um, and, and so you need to be able to be collaborating on that together in a constant process after release as well. And finally, I, I think the most crucial mindset, and to be honest, whether it's true or not, um, I started by saying that all the easy problems have been solved. Of course they aren't. Uh, there are plenty of, and I, I shouldn't even call them easy problems, I should call them simple problems, because they're not easy. But as 
individuals who are inspired to create change, I think it's worth looking for something big, even to give your simple problems context in. Um, find something wicked you don't know how to do yet today. Uh, and know how you can accelerate it. Uh, know that you can accelerate by being a designer and, and, and bring it forward and, and to be uh, something that you really charge in with. And I would just say, encourage you to act as if all of the easy problems have been solved. Thanks.